Hi there, it's Maria. I have lately been loving baking sourdough bread, so I put together a video to show you guys how I do it. So the first thing you're gonna need is some sourdough starter. This was given to me by a friend back in April, so it's been almost a year and my starter is going strong. So you can see I'm giving it a quick mix with a chopstick. You can use whatever you want. And you always start by discarding um, most of your starter. So I'm gonna zero out my scale and put the bowl in and I'm just gonna dump out the majority. The starter in the bowl is what is going to be used to make my loaves. And as long as you always hold a little bit back in the jar, you're gonna have more starter for your next project. So here, um, it ended up being about 90 grams in the bowl and you'll want 400 grams total for this recipe. So you always feed starter with equal parts flour and water. So you can see I'm gonna add 155 grams of water and 155 grams of flour. Um, I'm pouring water in from a kettle, but it is not hot. I did boil the water and that's because boiling the water kills off any chlorine or um, removes any minerals that can um, cause the yeast to not grow well but you definitely don't wanna pour in hot or um, even water that's too warm because that will kill your starter. So that has been sitting out and is cool now. Now you can see me adding the flour, 155 grams, and I'm using just the plain all-purpose flour. I buy it in bulk from Costco. There's no need to use bread flour or anything like that. I'm sure you can if you wanna experiment with that, but again, all-purpose flour has worked fine for me. I'm just gonna give it a good mix here and get that flour hydrated. Okay, so now I need to make sure I have enough starter for the next round. So I'm gonna zero out my scale again and I'm gonna feed uh, the starter in my jar, 45 grams of water, 45 grams of flour. A lot of people will tell you that you're supposed to feed your starter in a one to one to one ratio. I do not have 45 grams of starter in that little jar, but again, I have found as long as you add equal parts flour and water, your starter will be happy and grow well. So there's my 45 grams of water, and here come my 45 grams of flour and I'm just gonna combine that well. Now when you're mixing, you're gonna notice that your starter has a tendency to kind of creep up the sides. So what I do after I combine it with the chopstick is I get a bowl of water and I dip my fingers in and I just kind of wipe and scrape down the sides, push that starter down so it stays kind of in the center of that jar and I'm gonna do the same thing in the bowl. Now what I'm doing with the rubber band there is um, a really good tip. You want your starter to double. Um, it can even triple or grow beyond that, but you want it to at least double. That's a sign of a healthy starter. So that rubber band is a great idea. It marks the level so that you can easily see through the outside when your starter has doubled. Your oven here is going to serve as your proofing chamber. So you're gonna put both starters in. You're gonna cover them with a damp towel and um, the oven is not going to be turned on. All you're gonna do is turn the light on because that's all you need to get the inside of the oven to be the perfect temperature that yeast loves to grow. Here you can see I'm doing a quick check after about an hour and a half. Um, there's a little bit of activity, but not a whole lot going on. But four hours later, you can see that my starter, looking at that rubber band, has indeed doubled and that's ready to come out. I'm just gonna put a cap on it and put that back in my fridge for the next round. And the starter in the bowl, I'm just gonna leave that in there until I'm ready to start my baking. So I have heard people bake bread with two hour old starter, eight hour old starter. Um, I find four is the best for me. Sometimes I go five or six hours, but again, here I'm going to start the uh, flour and water mixture. So you can see I'm doing a mix of spelt flour and whole wheat flour. So the spelt flour I put in about 100 grams, which is 10%, and the whole wheat I put in about 150 grams, which is 15%, because we're looking for a total weight of 1,000 grams. So I don't zero out the scale in between because I just add the 
all-purpose flour until I reach 1,000 total grams. So you can see I've got 100 grams total weight now and I'm just going to combine those flours together gently with my hand and then add my water. So with this mixture, I'm going to add 650 grams of water. Now when I first started baking sourdough bread, I used 100% all-purpose flour and that's fine. But if you do that, if you want to start there, make sure you add only 600 grams of water and that's because whole wheat flour is thirstier than um, the all-purpose and that's why um, you need to add a little more water when you start experimenting with different types of flour. I just felt like adding some whole wheat flour would up the nutritional value a little bit and help with the flavor, but 100% um, all-purpose is also very delicious. So here you can see I'm just combining that flour and water together. It was a bit dry. I don't know if the humidity was a little low in my house. I didn't want to add any more water because um, in later steps, we do add uh, little bits of water here and there. And I didn't want the dough to get too wet. Now, tr uh, traditionally, sourdough is a high hydration dough, which means a lot of bakers you'll see take their dough past 70% hydration. I do not like to do that. I find that the dough is just too wet and too hard to work with. So I like to stick with my, you know, 65, 68% hydration, which um, by the time I add all the water in the other steps, I probably end up somewhere in that range. So go ahead and cover with a damp towel and put it back in the oven to proof. And from this point on, I'm going to leave the oven light off. And that's because the slightly lower temperature will cause a slower yeast growth, which will um, give better flavor development. So at this point, I'm ready to combine the starter with the dough. Um, Autolyse is the technical term for when you let the flour and water rest before you add the starter to it. You can do the autolyse step for 30 minutes. You can skip it completely. You can do it for five hours. You can even do it overnight. I've seen Lots of different people do it in different ways. So that is completely up to you. The auto lease step is just mainly to really give that flour a head start um, to absorb all that water and get hydrated. So I did about 30 minutes here. It was getting late and I wanted to get started. So the bowl of water, you dip your hands in there. It does help with um, keeping the dough from sticking to your hands. But honestly, in this first step, when we're combining the starter and the dough, it's going to be extremely sticky, extremely messy. So you're just going to have to roll with it. They are two completely different textures. The starter, it's actually even more runny than my starter typically is. Um, I may need to give it like an extra feeding next time to get the strength up a little bit. But um, you can see that you're going to just use a pinch and squeeze method to begin incorporating the two. There are um, a lot of videos out there that will show you, um, you know, slapping it on the counter and things like that. I just think it's way too messy. I prefer to just keep it in the bowl and knead and squeeze and um, press as much as I need to to get those two to combine and just keep that up until it's thoroughly combined. Now the dough does want to stick to itself so sometimes you'll see I kind of grab a big handful and try to pull the dough off the sides of the bowl but again I wouldn't worry too much about it because you can always um, just use some water and wipe down the sides a bit after you're done the main goal here is just to squeeze and press the dough until it's nicely combined nice and stretchy So here you see I'm trying to get the excess dough off my hands by just having it stick to the majority of the dough in the bowl. And then I'm just going to use some water and just wipe down the sides a little and kind of pat the dough all towards the middle. If you need bread, um, it makes a very satisfying sound when you kind of smack it, which is why you see me doing that a lot. All right, so back in the oven, and we're gonna set the timer for 30 minutes. So while we're waiting for the dough to rest, 
we are going to measure out our salt. I use 24 grams of diamond crystal salt, which is a kosher salt. If you use table salt, you may need to make adjustments since the salt level um, varies. So here you can see my dough after 30 minutes, it spread to all the sides of the bowl. And that's because the dough has not built enough strength yet. And we're gonna build that strength through a series of stretch and folds, which is the next process after we get the salt in. So you just sprinkle the salt on top. You can see I'm just putting some water to help dissolve it. And I'm going in with that pinch and squeeze motion again. And the texture of the dough will really change when you incorporate the salt. It's really important that you uh, knead until the salt is completely dissolved and you can no longer feel any little crystals with your hands. I was kneading um, and holding the camera and it was really difficult because the bowl was moving. So I did put the camera down for about a minute and you can see how quickly the dough texture changes with just a little bit of kneading. Okay, back into the oven for a 30 minute rest. And after 30 minutes, you can see I set the timer first, 31 minutes, because this next step is gonna take us less than a minute. So I'm gonna pull the dough out and I'm going to wet my hand and I'm gonna do a technique called stretch and flip. So you can see I'm gonna lift the dough and just stretch it high and then flip it right on top of itself. And I'm gonna just go around the bowl, wetting my hand so that it doesn't stick to me. And once you go all the way around, um, I'm gonna now do just a little bit of a stretch and lift here where you grab the middle and just kind of fold the ends back down underneath. That builds some surface tension and allows the dough to rise. Now this is building strength and you're gonna do this six times. I did not have the time to film myself doing it six times. So just take my word for it, a 30 minute rest in between, I did four stretch and flips, and then the last two times I just did the lift from the middle. So once you do that, you're gonna go ahead and just flip the dough out onto a clean, dry counter, and just use a bench scraper to divide it into two, and kind of shape them into rounds. You're gonna give them a little bit of a bench rest while you prep your bannetons. So these are bamboo bannetons that I bought from Amazon and they come with liners. You don't have to use them. I often use them without the liner and I get that nice um, pattern on my dough. But this time I've been having some trouble with my dough sticking. So I decided to use the liners so that um, the bread would turn out easily for this video. So you're gonna just liberally dust them with rice flour and all purpose flour. And here you can see the dough is starting to spread a little bit and that's because it's been resting on the counter. So you're gonna go ahead and give it a flip and the dough should be nice and relaxed. So you're gonna fold the top down, fold the sides over, and then when you fold the bottom piece up, you're actually gonna turn it so that the bottom piece, when you fold it over, it ends up on the bottom. And um, when you do that, the seam is on the bottom so it seals. And then when you put it in the banneton, you actually flip it so that um, the seam is up. I hope that made sense. So you can see after I did the folding, I'm gonna bring the banneton over, sprinkle some flour because I do not want it to stick. I'm gonna scoop it up and flip it upside down into the banneton because that's gonna be the top of the dough and you want that on the bottom of the proofing bowl. So this is what they look like after they've been moved to their bannetons. And now I'm gonna cover them with plastic bags just so that the bags don't touch the dough inside and I'm gonna put them in the fridge. You can proof these for a minimum of 12 hours up to 72 hours, but this time I did 36. Here is a nice Dutch oven that I use. Um, it's very important because it allows your dough to spring up. So you're gonna put the pot and the lid in your oven and you're gonna go ahead and preheat your oven to 500 degrees. Now my oven does not actually reach 500 degrees which is why I put it to 530 because then the actual temperature inside your oven is closer to 500. And you're gonna wanna let those warm up and then heat to 500 degrees for at least 40 minutes if not an hour. So you can see I pulled my dough out from the fridge and let it come to room temperature. And the whole time the uh, Dutch oven is heating in there, the dough is resting at room temp. 
So here we go. I'm going to pull out the hot Dutch oven. Be very careful, it is very hot. This parchment paper has been trimmed so that when I lay it over top, um, I'll have two handles extending, but I won't have too much excess. So I'm gonna flip it out and they came out nicely because I used the flowered liner. Now I'm gonna use just a razor blade here. Fancy people, they use a lamb, but I find this razor blade from the local pharmacy works just fine. I do one big slash and then a bunch of little ones. I think it kind of looks pretty like a wheat sheaf. And sometimes when you transfer it with those handles, it kind of closes your um, slash. So you can see I just re-slashed it a little bit. You're gonna put it in the oven, cover it with the lid tightly, set it in the center, and set your timer for 23 minutes. Now, as soon as I start the first loaf, I pull out the second loaf and let that one start coming to room temperature. So after 23 minutes, you're just going to remove the lid and you can see the bread has sprung up beautifully. The cast iron, pot um, keeps the moisture which allows it to rise and at this point you're going to lower the temperature to 450 and you're going to bake for another 23 minutes with the lid off 23 minutes later and you can pull out the pot and use the parchment paper handles to lift the loaf right out of the pot so go ahead and transfer it to a wire cooling rack to cool. And this is really important. Do not cut open your loaf for at least an hour, if not two hours. Um, if you cut it too early, the steam inside will cause your bread texture to be gummy. You really want to give it a chance to cool properly and you will not regret it. So here you can see it's just take two. Reheat to 500. Slash your dough, add it in, lid on, 23 minutes. After 23 minutes, the lid comes off. You can see the bread has sprung up. Lower the temperature to 450 and bake for another 23 minutes. So go ahead and remove the second loaf, let it cool. And at this point, my first loaf has been cooling for well over an hour since I preheated the cast iron at 500 degrees for another 30, 40 minutes before I started the second loaf. And now the moment you've all been waiting for, we're going to go ahead and slice in. Using a long bread knife, go ahead and cut right down the middle. And here's our first cross section. Looks amazing. So the loaf was a teeny bit warm, which is why it's harder to cut thin slices. But you can see here, nice, stretchy, delicious bread with a beautiful crust. Now as a fan of Bon Appetit, I always love to finish my bread and butter with a sprinkle of flaky sea salt. This is Malden because I had not seen Brad's episode when he visited Jacobson's. So sorry, Brad, maybe next time. So there you have it, a sourdough loaf made from flour, salt, water, and the naturally occurring yeast in your home. I know it can seem a little intimidating, but hopefully you'll give it a try after seeing the steps broken down. It's a lot of waiting. I would definitely start pretty early in the morning if you want to give it a go so you're not up to till 3 a.m. like I was, but it's totally worth it and I think you'll like it. Thanks for watching everyone. Bye.